hello uh, sir there is some problem with uh, anurag sir joining so uh, we are trying something again i'll just keep you updated i'll let you know what is what is the yeah sir sir is not able to join that is why i'll just cancel the password i have cancelled it i am i'm sending you again yeah i think it will happen now it's happening yeah yeah just a second i'll send you a message yeah Hello, sir. Are you are you there? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay, great, great, great. Finally. Share share screen, na? Bottom bottom green, bottom green. Share screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can hear me. Yes. And you can. See. Okay. So should we start? Yes. But can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, no, not your computer screen. हाँ तो what do you do desk one share screen नहीं share screen below the green button हाँ green button I pressed okay okay अच्छा हाँ the many things are open okay that's me yes can you see now yes sir okay and I am putting it on full screen So there are two PowerPoints today, which we'll do. Um, I'm switching. Hmm. Can you now see the full screen? Okay. Can you see? Hello. Uh, no, no. The screen. It is frozen. It's frozen. My screen now. No, it's not. Safe. No, no. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Can I share? Please. Sharing is pause. Sharing is pause. Because bring your shared window to the front. Bring your shared window to the front. Resume. Resume share. Huh. Now. Yes. Not, not yet. Not yet. No. No. Hmm. Go on. Launch Zoom again. No. Can you unshare and share again? Okay. I'm going to zoom. Unshare. Okay. Stop share. Eh? Stop share. And then. What about now? Can you share my see my screen? No, no, not seeing. No. I'm pressing share screen. Leave meeting. Leave meeting and come back. Can I do that? Uh, share screen is not happening. Yeah, yeah. We can see the screen. See the screen? Yeah. Okay. So starting with the, this PowerPoint. Can you see this PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yes? Yes, yes. First slide. First slide, okay? Yes. yes. Okay. And you can hear the sound? Okay, let us quickly do it. So I'll go fast because we already wasted some time on technology failure. Um, so modern surgery is technology driven or technology based and sometimes it can fail. 
Uh, so, uh, very quickly, uh, Lord Monihan has been a father figure in uh, modern surgery. He was this, uh, the originator of British General of Surgery and uh, uh, very famous you know, for designing instruments for gallbladder surgery. You all have heard of Monihan's uh, dissecting forceps and all. So, he said that surgery for cancer, malignant disease, is actually the anatomical dissection of the regional nodal lymphatic basin. And this was based on the work of Rudolf Ferkov, who had done some uh, um, post-mortem studies in Germany and, this, and saw that most patients who had died of cancer, whether it was cancer of the uh, breast or any other organ, actually had involvement, almost always had involvement of the regional nodes. So he said that tumor is first goes to the from primary tumor to the regional nodes and from there it spreads. So this theory became popular and everybody started doing radical lymph node dissection or block dissection as we call it in surgery. So we all know that William Stuart Halstead started with his Halstead medical mastectomy and then George Washington Kriel performed radical neck dissection for cancer of the oral cavity, head and neck cancers. And Ernest Miles uh, very soon followed with his abdominoperineal combined resection for cancer of the rectum. But very soon, surgeons as well as their patients realized that there were some problems. A problem of uh, causing pain um, in the operated area because surgeons were cutting a lot of sensory nerves, pain, nerve fibers. There was paresthesia and anesthesia. And almost inevitably, there was some swelling or lymphedema due to removal of the lymph nodes and lymphatics. And whenever there's a lot of swelling and edema in the wound, uh, you see increased risk of surgical site infection and wound breakdown and so on. So people realized that uh, there were a lot of problems with block dissection. And imagine a person where all the nodes in a block dissection show no, no cancer cells. So you feel really stupid having performed such a major operation and found, having found that all the nodes do not harbor cancer cells. So uh, there were problems associated with radical no dissection um, of any organ. So let us now go on to this. Um, right. So this is a a cartoon diagram showing the axillary vein, the pectoralis minor. Pectoralis major has been divided here and opened up to demonstrate the axilla. And suppose there is a tumor in the breast, primary tumor in the breast here. The lymphatics carry the tumor cells to the first station node, which is located in lower part of the axilla. This part of the axilla is called level 1. Level 1 is the axillary nodal basin or located lateral to the pectoralis minor. This muscle, this fan-shaped muscle going from third, fourth, fifth, or sixth, third to sixth or second to fifth ribs from here, it goes like a fan and gets inserted onto the coracoid process. Okay, so this is pectoralis minor and axillary nodal basin has been divided into three parts, level one, two and three. Level one is that which lies lateral lateral to the pectoralis minor, level 2 is behind the pectoralis minor and level 3 is above and medial, supramedial, this part of the axilla, above and medial to the pectoralis minor has been labeled apical nodes or apex of the axilla, okay, or level 3 nodes. So 1, 2 and 3. So the nodes are located just lateral to the pectoralis major and minor muscles. This is first station node. Then efferent of that node will go to higher order nodes. They go to level 2 and then from level 2 to level 3. And from there, the efferent of the axillary, all the nodes will become subclavian lymph trunk. And then it, it enters the thoracic duct on the left side and right lymphatic duct on the right side. Okay, And this is how the lymph starting from the breast primary eventually reaches the venous circulation, right? So this is a method of lymphatic to venous circulation and spread of the tumor. 
So this is the nodal description. And in most patients, this will happen. So first lower order nodes, then from lower order to middle order nodes, and from mid to higher order, highest order nodes. Echelon, lowest echelon, second echelon, and then highest echelon of nodes. So there are three tiers or echelon or order of the nodes. And about 98% of the nodes first involved, first involved in the breast cancer are located just lateral to the pectoral muscles and medial to this vein. Can anybody tell what is this vein? Whenever you dissect the axilla, you find a long vein passing across in a vertical fashion into the axilla. This is lateral thoracic vein, lateral thoracic, okay? Lateral thoracic vein. So 98% of the nodes first involved by the cancer are between pectoral muscle and the lateral thoracic vein, lateral thoracic vein, okay? Just remember that. And this nerve here is going to... Let us know. So this is about the axillary nodal basin, okay? Now, why do we need to evaluate the axilla? We need to evaluate the axilla in patients with invasive breast cancer where you have uh, to assess the patient and stage the disease. And uh, it has been found to be a very important factor in determining the prognosis of the patient. Okay, prognosis. And modern oncologists decide the adjuvant therapy, what drugs to give uh, on the basis of the nodes involved, the number of nodes involved, whether there is perinodal spread or not. So for all that, you need to evaluate the axillary tissue. So ALND, or axillary lymph node dissection, has been shown to be most effective method of treating involved axillary nodes. So if you have axillary nodal metastasis and somebody asks what is the most effective treatment, you should say it is axillary lymph node dissection. Okay, axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, there are some lines coming up on the screen. I don't know whether it is a function of zoom. I just drew... Hmm? Can anybody tell? Can, are you seeing these lines? Okay, now they have gone. Okay, thank you. And now, so this was about the invasive cancer. Okay, in invasive cancer, these are the reasons why we do axillary dissection. Stage and prognosticate, deciding adjuvant therapy. And if nodes are involved, this is also therapeutic. Okay. If you have in situ cancer of the breast, carcinoma, ductal carcinoma in the breast, then we need sentinel node biopsy because if there is a focus of invasion or microinvasion hidden in a in situ cancer, then we need to assess the nodes. Okay, so we do sentinel node biopsy in patients with in situ cancer if we are doing mastectomy. Okay, so this is the reason that in an in situ tumor. Hello. Huh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Should I continue? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Because somebody is asking. Okay. So in in situ cancer, we need to assess the axillary nodes because if you are doing mastectomy and you have cut all the lymphatics going from the breast to the axilla and later on in that mass, there is a small focus of invasive focus. Okay. Then your oncologist will say, please tell me whether the nodes are involved or not. And by that time, you have done mastectomy, you have caught all the lymphatics, then there is no way of going back and doing the sentinel node biopsy. So that's why it is recommended to do sentinel node biopsy for an in situ cancer because if there is a hidden focus of invasive cancer inside a in situ tumor, then you need to assess those nodes. Okay, have you understood this? In situ cancer doesn't spread to the nodes, but about 30 to 40 percent of biopsy shown invasive cancer may actually have a focus of invasion or micro invasion. And you will come to know about it only after you have removed the whole tumor or done a mastectomy and then cut finer sections. You know, it is called bread loafing. If you go to pathology department and see how they do the grossing of the breast specimen, 
maybe in the next session i'll put some slide to show how it is done so they slice the uh, whole breast as if you are cutting a loaf of bread that's why it's called bread loafing so like a loaf of bread you cut it slices and in that slicing you can reveal a small focus of invasive cancer which was missed on the pre operative core needle biopsy okay so for that invasive focus you need nodal assessment now so axillary node is spread in breast cancer how it happens so if you have a lady who has no palpable nodes okay then it has been found by several studies that about one third about one third patients will have a small tumor in the lymph nodes even if no node is palpable okay even if no node is palpable about 30 to 40% of patients will harbor cancer cells microscopic cancer cells in their axillary nodes okay This, we are talking of a lady where no axillary node is palpable 30 to 40% will have microscopic focus so uh, initial data from nsabp b04 trial showed in this b04 trial they had randomized women to either receive radical halsted mastectomy which radical halsted mastectomy which was the standard of care in 1970s this was the first, one of the earliest nsabp trial started in america okay so in one arm they did the standard treatment of radical mastectomy in the other arm they took women and operated by operation of total mastectomy total mastectomy and with without touching the axilla okay only only removal of the breast they did not go into the axilla and in the third arm they did total mastectomy and then followed by radiotherapy radiotherapy okay so just see the results in women who have radical mastectomy and in radical mastectomy what do you do what are the structures removed in radical mastectomy can somebody tell quickly what are the structures removed in radical right. mastectomy so i'll quickly to save time the whole breast containing the tumor with 2 cm with 2 cm of skin around the tumor nipple areola complex pectoral fascia pectoralis major muscle pectoralis minor muscle axillary tail and level 1 2 and 3 axillary lymph nodes these are the structures removed in radical mastectomy and in patty or modified radical mastectomy you remove the whole breast with 2 cm of skin around the tumor nipple areola complex pectoral fascia pectoralis minor muscle axillary tail and level 1 2 and 3 axillary oh lymph nodes you preserve the pectoralis major muscle okay that is in modified radical mastectomy or pt so they found that in women who had this mastectomy 40% had microscopic cancer cells in the axillary lymph nodes these axillary nodes were not palpable they are impalpable these women had clinically impalpable in early 70s 1970s when this trial was started there was no axillary sonography or ultrasound okay ultrasound was not available it was not being done in patients so it was only clinically impalpable axillary nodes okay 40% had microscopic cancer cells in the axillary nodes then in the mastectomy arm in the mastectomy arm only 90% developed detective recurrence later on on follow up so why out of 40% only 19% are developing as as recurrence so what is happening to remaining half half of 40 is 20 you know so only half of the patients are developing recurrence other half are not developing recurrence even if their axillary nodes have been left in the body so obviously they are being controlled by body's immune system uh, cytotoxic t lymphocytes natural killer cells and so on in those days please remember that these patients were not given any systemic chemotherapy chemotherapy was not being practiced so body's immune system 
looks after half the cancer cells. Now, in women, where total mastectomy was followed by radiotherapy, the axillary recurrence occurred only in 2.9, you can say 3% of cases. So from 19% recurrence in the total mastectomy only, if you give radiotherapy, from 19, it becomes 2.9. Okay? So remaining cancer cells, 19 minus 2.9 is how much? 16, um, right? About 16. So 16% cancer cells can be killed by radiotherapy. So the lessons learned from NSAP B04 trial were that 40% women harbored cancer cells microscopically in the clinically impalpable axilla. Of those, only 19% developed clinical recurrence. So half of the cancer cells were controlled by body's immune defense system. And if we give radiotherapy to these patients, we can still reduce from 19% to 2.9%. So 16% of the cancer can be controlled by radiotherapy. So the lessons are, number one, microscopic disease stays in about 40%. Only half develop the clinical recurrence and radiotherapy is very effective in microscopic cancer in the nodes. Microscopic cancer in the nodes. Okay. So 40% only half manifest clinically. Of these half, that is 20%, only 3% remain active. Radiotherapy can reduce these 5, 6, that is 16% of cancers. So radiotherapy is effective in controlling microscopic cancer cells. Okay. Now the question comes, are we really helping these women if we perform axillary node dissection in those who do not have any palpable nodes, clinically negative axilla? Are we really serving these ladies by doing axillary node dissection? So this was the question asked by a gentleman called Orr in 1999. He performed a meta-analysis and found that 5.4% survival benefit was accrued to women who received axillary dissection in clinically negative axilla. So he demonstrated that there was 5.4% survival benefit by doing prophylactic axillary dissection. Please remember, we are talking of about 30 years ago where adjuvant systemic therapy was not being practiced and uh, there was some problem in statistical or, uh, statistics. Okay, So if we come to evaluate the modern uh, trials where axillary lymph node dissection has been performed in women who do not have palpable nodes, clinically negative axilla. Okay? And there is a systemic review and meta-analysis by Dr. Mona Sanghani and uh, group. And this was a very nice study and they demonstrated that actually there is no survival benefit with axillary node dissection among women who have clinically negative axilla. Okay? So if there are no palpable nodes in the axilla, you are not helping the lady by, help, by reducing death. Okay? So there is no survival benefit of prophylactic axillary node dissection. Please, very important, okay? Right. Now, in the most uh, arena of surgery, we have witnessed the invasion of this concept of minimal access or minimally invasive surgery. So, breast surgery and axillary surgery were no exception to this um, emerging belief. And surgeons were trying to minimize the extent of radical uh, radicality or radical dissection. Uh, and way back in 1967, surgeons in Cardiff um, Breast Clinic, led by Professor A.P.M. Forrest, Sir Forrest, uh, demonstrated that we can perform node biopsy. So they, they did a randomized trial, it's called Cardiff trial, where half the women had only total mastectomy plus the removal of these four or five nodes called pectoral node biopsy. And the other half were treated by full 
रेडिकल मेस्टेक्टमी और हार्सटेड मेस्टेक्टमी ओके सो सो दिनिमल एक्सेस सर्जरी और मिनिमल इनवेजिव सर्जरी हैज बीन देयर इन ब्रेस्ट सर्जरी सिंस 1967 एंड सो दिस वाज द फर्स्ट स्टडी वेयर मिनिमल एक्सेस सर्जरी कांसेप्ट वाज प्रूवन एंड शोन दैट इफ यू ओनली रिमूव फोर और फाइव नोड्स फ्रॉम द लोअर पार्ट ऑफ द एक्सिला from the pectoral region also called pectoral node biopsy or axillary sampling you can assess the axilla and treat the rest by radiotherapy okay so this was the concept of minimal axis surgery for the first time in breast surgery now we take you to the sentinel node concept and sentinel node concept is shown on this uh, picture so if you want to go and meet your professor and head of surgery okay and you go in front of a surgery office and you ask the guard the guard is there on the front of your boss you ask the uh, ask the guard is sir inside if the guard says yes then you go inside the office and do your job okay if the guard says no i have not seen sir going inside you don't fiddle around there you don't waste your time there you you know so this is the concept of asking the guard similar to this we have a few nodes standing on the gate way of axilla and we ask the guard have you seen cancer going inside if the guard says yes then you go inside and you clear all the axillary nodes and perform axillary node dissection however if the guard says no i have not seen cancer going inside you don't fiddle around there you don't waste your time you don't disturb the nodes which mother nature has so beautifully created for some purpose and what is the purpose purpose is to drain the lymph not only from the mammary gland not only from the torso from the upper part of the trunk but also carry the lymph from the upper limb can you see i'm showing uh, can you see my pointer here can somebody say yes sir yes. so so it has a dual it's a common pathway the lymphatics from the upper arm right these green lines join the lymphatics of the mammary gland and from the upper part of the chest trunk torso and then there is a common pathway if we remove all these nodes we are disturbing the lymphatic drainage of the chest of the breast but also of the upper limb okay because there is a common pathway and we have removed these lymphatic now the lymph the upper limb collects and this causes lymph edema okay so please remember this and this can happen because of this common pathway this lymph edema can happen even if you do one or two sentinel node biopsy some patients 5 to 7% of the patients even after sentinel node biopsy can develop lymphedema why because there is a shared pathway the lymphatics of the upper limb and lymphatics of the breast are following a common shared pathway you remove this node you are cutting the lymphatics of the upper limb also so there is always a risk of causing lymphedema if we remove these nodes here okay even if you do sentinel node biopsy 5% chance of lymphedema exists so this is the concept of sentinel node have you understood this concept of sentinel node biopsy sentinel in oxford dictionary means the guard chaukidar you know guard or chaukidar sentinel okay if you go to the border town of um, leh ladakh kashmir or uh, tibet side uttarakhand uh, or china border you will find uh, they ne sentinel of the country sentinel of you know so army units are called sentinels of the nation so the sentinel means the guard or chaukidar and like a chaukidar or a guard there is a lymph node or set of nodes which are standing on the gate of the axilla and we ask the guard by we identify the guard by some methods and then ask the guard have you seen cancer going inside if the guard says yes then we clear the axilla if guard says no then we don't disturb these nodes which mother nature has created and guard is right you know guard is right why guard is right can anybody guess why guard is right 
that guard says i have not seen uh, sir going inside the office because there is no back door entry right if there was another door to the sir's office sir your professor and head would have entered from the back door but there is no back door entry and therefore guard is right in telling that sir has not gone inside okay so guard is right in telling you the truth whether cancer has gone inside or not because there is no back door entry back door entry in the breast means the lymphatics are not bypassing this node they are not going from the primary tumor this is primary tumor uh, they are not going directly to the higher nodes without passing through the sentinel node they are right in majority of these patients so this is the concept of sentinel lymph node sentinel in oxford dictionary mean a guard one who keeps a vigil right a watch or a sentry the first node in the regional node basin that drains the primary tumor it may be a group of nodes it may be two or three nodes four nodes so it may be a single node or a cluster of lymph nodes please remember this it can be three nodes see here to some lymphatics are coming from here other lymphatics again coming from here some to go into this node or this node so it may be set of three nodes not just one so sentinel node may be a group of nodes which have the highest chance of receiving the lymph from the primary organ in this case the breast and it is defined as a hot node hot on the gamma isotope intake blue if you inject blue dye or a fluorescent if you inject fluorescent dye or palpable node hot blue fluorescent or palpable node or a node in which a blue lymphatic is seen to enter that is also defined as a flor as a sentinel node so please remember in the viva they may ask you how do you define a sentinel node so sentinel node is a hot blue fluorescent or palpable node or a node in which a blue or colored lymphatic is seen to enter sometimes the amount of dye reaching the node will be so less that it will stain only the lymphatics it will not stain the node but if you are seeing a colored lymphatic entering the node you should also call it a sentinel lymph node and it may be just a cluster of nodes or a single node okay now we owe a great deal in breast surgery to this gentleman dr krishna klau from paris institute and beautifully conducted a study in 2010 published in british journal of surgery and uh, please share this reference and they found where are these sentinel nodes located okay so very nice study published in british journal of surgery august 2010 so this is the pictorial depiction of the data from dr krishna klaus study so this is axillary vein this is chest wall and pectoralis major muscle major and minor and this green line is intercostal brachial nerve intercostal brachial nerve can somebody tell what is intercostal brachial nerve please quickly intercostal brachial nerve what is intercostal brachial nerve it is the lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve very good second intercostal nerve so you know the mammary gland is supplied from it is located in front of second to sixth ribs right second to sixth intercostal yes. spaces so naturally it will share the intercostal nerves located in second to sixth area that is t2 to t6 so nerve supply of the breast is t2 to t6 intercostal nerves thoracic nerves now the branch from the second becomes very prominent and conspicuous and it enters into the armpit where we apply the you know every morning after bath you spray some powder and then perspirant anti perspirant you know so that is the area where that skin is being supplied by this intercostal brachial nerve it's a lateral cutaneous branch of second or t2 lateral cutaneous branch of second thoracic nerve okay and supplies the area of the armpit where we apply anti perspirant okay now so if you divide the axilla into these two lines one vertical line this line is lateral thoracic vein here and this horizontal green line is intercostal brachial nerve so you get four areas can you see this okay so dr krishna klau found that 86% of these sentinel nodes were located in this 
A area, area. Why? What is that? Below the intercostal brachial nerve and medial to the medial. This is lateral. This is medial. Okay. This is lateral and this is chest wall or medial. So, 86% of the sentinel nodes are located below the intercostal brachial nerve and medial to lateral thoracic vein. Please remember this. If you are doing sentinel node biopsy, you should first look into this area. Dissect lateral to the chest wall and medial to lateral thoracic vein. And stay first below the intercostal brachial nerve. Okay? 86% of the sentinel nodes are lying here. 11.5% above the intercostal brachial nerve is still medial to the lateral thoracic vein. So it is 6 below and 11.5 above the intercostal brachial nerve. So if you add A and B together, that is 98, 98. A plus B is 98.2. Right? Almost every, you can say, of the sentinel nodes are located between the chest wall and lateral thoracic vein. Lateral thoracic vein. Okay, just remember these. And in the lateral to thoracic vein, the C and D are very small. Only 1.8 percent out of 100, out of 1,000, out of 1,000 ladies, only 18, 1,000 lady, 18 will have the node in C or D. Okay, out of 1,000 ladies, uh, 982, 982. Remove the decimal if you are taking 1,000 patient. This is percent. So. Out of 1,000 women, 982 women will have their sentinel nodes located medial to lateral thoracic vein. Okay? Very important. So, please read this article. Now, how do we identify this sentinel node, the guard? There are various methods. One is injecting some blue dye. It can be methylene blue. It can be isosulfane blue. And... Uh, then you can inject some radioisotope like technetium, which is a gamma emitting isotope, gamma ray emitting isotope with tagging with sulfur colloid. Sulfur colloid is a small particulate matter, uh, and uh, or you it's can use albumin, hours. or you can use albumin, or you can use antimony. Okay, antimony is uh, uh, commonly used in Australia and uh, Dr. Gaurav Agrawal in Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute in Lucknow also uh, uses this. He says it's much cheaper than sulfur colloid. It's easier to make compared to sulfur colloid, which is more expensive. So basically, lymphatics carry the large particles. Particle size more than 12 nanometer, more than 12 nanometer can only be drained by lymphatics. So you need a large particulate matter which is taken selectively by lymphatics and either sulfur colloid or albumin or antimony or they have used charcoal in the India ink has been used in the past. So all these particles can be used to identify the lymphatics. Okay. Now we can also inject some fluorescent dye such as fluorescein, such as indocyanin green. Now, it has also been found by a large number of randomized trials and prospective cohort studies that combination of use of two tracers, combination of two tracers, that is one isotope and one blue dye, yields the highest identification rate in 95 to 100% cases. If you use one tracer, only blue dye, you get about 85 to 90%. If you use only radioisotope, you will get about 85 to 90 percent. So you'll miss about 5 to 10 percent patients if you use single tracer. If you combine two tracers, then identification becomes higher in the tune of 95 to 100 percent. Almost everybody can be picked up if you use a combination of two tracers. So this is the current belief, and most of the data presently demonstrates this fact. Okay. So this is one picture where we have injected a blue dye and then opened up the axilla by cutting the skin in lateral memory crease and then dissecting the fat and then identifying these lymphatics. Can you see this lymphatic? So there's a one lymph node, then it is going into this colored lymphatic and then it is entering into the second node. So this is what I was saying that if you 
see a colored lymphatic entering into a node and the node itself is not colored, even then by definition you have to call it a central node. If the amount of dye is so less that it did not color the node, did not color the node, nevertheless it is the lymphatic and lymph node draining the breast because you injected the dye in the breast. So by definition you have to call it a central node. A node which is blue or fluorescent or hot on the gamma ray or a node where a colored lymphatic is seen to enter. All these are definitions of sentinel nodes. So what is the beauty of sentinel node biopsy? Well, you give one, you give this node and this node. We just gave two nodes to the pathologist in this lady and then requested our pathologist to tell us about the status of these nodes. So at leisure time, he uh, made nice slices of the node and then told that, look, none of the two nodes have any cancer cells. Okay, so the pathologist can assess two nodes by very fine slicing, two millimeter section slices, and do a specialist training if needed. And at leisure, if there is doubt, they can go to their friends and discuss among themselves, and then arrive at a diagnosis, whether this, these nodes contain cancer cells, metastasis or not, okay. On the other hand, if you give them 20 nodes in axillary dissection, in full axillary lymph node dissection, ALND, what do we give them? We give full lot of fat, fibro fatty tissue, in which we have about 15 to 20 nodes embedded within this fibro fatty tissue. So they cut only one section per node. In all the hospitals in the world, even in Tata Memorial or England, America, everywhere, they cut only one section per lymph node. So if you have given them 50 nodes, they will just slice every node once and then tell whether they have cancer cells. Now you can imagine if you have a big node and then you cut only one section, you may miss, suppose this was a big node, see. So this was a big node here, okay? Can you see this big node, all green node? They cut only one section here. There's a small focus of cancer here, they will miss that. There's only one sec hospital in the world that is Milan Institute of Oncology in Milan in Italy, uh, where Dr. Amberto Veronese worked. And there they do full node processing, two millimeter slices of all the nodes. So because they have a lot of uh, pathologists and backup facility. But in all other hospitals, because of workload, they will cut only one section per node. So the conventional youth think that you have done a great job. You remove 20 nodes, you feel very happy. But you don't realize uh, um, your um, you know lack of prudence, lack of intellect, that your pathologist is only cutting one section per node, and a lot of uh, nodes have been unnecessarily sectioned and removed. So, if you do sentinel node biopsy, you allow detailed evaluation of one or two nodes by a pathologist. Okay, that's the advantage. So it is more accurate in staging the axilla than full ALND. So uh, we learned it way back in 1999 when one of us, Dr. V. Sinu, he went to the, uh, the Makkah Medina of uh, sentinel node biopsy. Sentinel node biopsy was developed by Dr. Uh, Morton, D.L. Morton in Santa Monica, California, John Wayne Institute, very famous center where sentinel node biopsy concept was developed. And uh, Dr. D.L. Morton performed it for melanoma. And later on, Dr. David Craig in the same hospital used isotope. And then uh, Dr. Armando Giuliano uh, used blue dye. Okay. So uh, Dr. Sinu from Ames went to Dr. Armando Giuliano. He spent three months there in 1999. And then he learned the technique from the guru, great guru. He came back to India, taught me and many others uh, in India. And then... Uh, we have been doing sentinel node biopsy since 1999 and uh, around uh, 2005, we evaluated our first 500 patients and we found a high diagnostic accuracy and uh, false negative in the tune of 8%, which is also the global published results. So first you have to validate the sentinel node biopsy. When you start the sentinel node biopsy program, you should take about 30 to 40 patients 
perform sentinel node biopsy and then remove rest of the axillary nodes okay to know whether you are performing it correctly or not and then ask the pathologist whether what is their sensitivity specificity okay so you should do 30 to 40 patients initially where you do sentinel node biopsy followed by full axillary node dissection send two separate specimens the sentinel node in one bottle two or three nodes and the rest of the axilla as separate specimen okay so two separate specimens should be sent and the uh, you should have high diagnostic accuracy and sensitivity um, about 90 plus so these are our publications you can read more about them and then we come to a very interesting trial done by professor v c nu in aims you know uh, there was problem of getting the costly blue dye from outside patent blue patent blue has been used in america and england but patent blue is very expensive and cost 60 dollar per ampule 60 dollars okay so dr sinu performed a very prudent uh, randomized trial he took uh, these women 458 and uh, then randomized 237 of them and offered either methylene blue in half them and other half were randomized to receive patent blue so two blue dyes were compared in a randomized fashion and we found that these are the results identification 97% of the nodes where methylene blue was used and 96% of the nodes where patent blue was used so exactly similar 97 and 96.6 almost similar identification of the sentinel lymph nodes was achieved whether you give methylene blue or patent blue okay so is this visible this data can you all see this table hello yes sir so yes. you can take a note of this data okay now uh, he uh, dr sinu also uh, discovered that those women who were having full axillary node dissection what was the false negative rate so it was exactly similar um, in both the groups okay so the 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 um, the message from this randomized trial where methylene blue was compared with patent blue was that identification of 96 97% can be achieved with this methylene blue which is readily available one ampule of 5 ml costs about 50 to 60 rupees and easily available in most centers gynecologists use it for hysterosalpingography you know hysterosalping go you know in patient with sterility they inject the blue dye in the uh, fallopian tube okay so same blue dye or the urologists use it for identifying ureter Uh, by retrograde uh, uh, manner put a uretric catheter and inject the blue dye so same methylene blue dye um, can be used with a um, reasonable success same success as patent blue okay another method of evaluating the axilla is called axillary sampling axillary nodal sampling sampling is uh, um, going back to 1967 where in cardiff it was shown that you can remove four nodes from the lower part of the axilla okay so this was called cardiff trial in 1967 sir apm forest described it and he was taking four nodes from just pectoral region just lateral to pectoralis major and minor he was taking four or five nodes so sampling the lower part of the axilla lower part level 1 axilla taking about four nodes was called axillary sampling or axillary um in tata memorial hospital professor rajan badwe dr um, um vani parmar and dr neeta uh, practiced it quite uh, um, profusely and uh, they dissect the lower part of the axilla between pectoralis uh, major and latissimus dorsi okay so uh, staying below the 
lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve, that is intercostal brachial nerve. So this is called axillary sampling. So if you do not uh, know tracer material, then you can perform axillary sampling. Okay, and there are papers from um, literature showing axillary sampling is is a is a um, effective method of evaluating the axilla. Okay. Now there is a famous trial um, named by Dr. Armando Giuliano study, and this is um, they took eight ninety one patients randomized for sentinel node biopsy, and the node were positive. The two nodes or two or more nodes are positive. So in one arm they perform axillary node dissection, and other arm they do only sentinel node biopsy, and then followed these patients in both arms. Okay, so. Okay. Now, just a word about uh, how to evaluate the axillary nodes after sentinel node biopsy. Okay. So, if the node is very small, less than four millimeter in size, you just cut it in the middle by half. Okay. The node is by half. By okay, just half. Half will go to the one section, and other half two sections. So, only two slices are made. Uh, if you have Node less than four centimeter, okay, two millimeter. Only one section, two millimeter. If node is greater than four millimeter in size, then you cut two millimeter slices, two millimeter. So this is one slice. This is two millimeter. This is two millimeter. This is two millimeter. At two millimeter intervals, you keep cutting the slices, okay, till the whole node is sectioned. Why we cut at two millimeter distance is very important. In the axilla, uh, axillary sentinel nodes, three types of metastasis can occur, depending on the size of the metastasis. If metastasis is greater than two millimeter, greater than two millimeter, you can you see two millimeter? Okay, this metastasis is greater, just bigger than two millimeter. This is called macro metastasis. Macro, M A C R O, macro. More than two millimeter, okay. Less than two, up to 0 0.2. 0 0.2 to two is called micro metastasis. Micro, M-I-C-R-O, micro. And anything just scattered few cells here and there are called isolated tumor cells. Okay. So if you have macro metastasis that is more than two mm, you will get little bit either in this section. If you miss here, you will cut it here. Okay. And in um, breast cancer, large number of trials and long follow-up studies have shown that it is only macro metastasis in the sentinel node which is important, which matters. Matters means it determines the long-term survival, local re regional recurrence in the axilla, and based on the results of this macro metastasis, we have to offer further therapy, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Okay, macro metastasis more than 2 mm. That's why you cut 2 millimeter slices of the nodes. What is micro metastasis? 2 mm to 0.2 mm. Okay, greater than 0.2 mm, but up to 2 mm. More than 2 mm will be called macro metastasis. Macro. Okay, so this is micro. And if you have just small cells here and there located dispersed in the lymph node, they will be termed isolated tumor cells, ITC. Okay. Sometimes you may not see them under classical HNE, hematoxylene and acid staining. So this is a on the left upper corner. This corner here. Can you see my cursor here? Okay, this section. Hello. Yes, sir. Are you all awake? Okay, so this is a standard hematoxylene stain section of a lymph node. Okay, and you don't see anything grossly abnormal here. When the same section is stained by a dye called cytokeratin 19, cytokeratin 19, you see some black area, brownish dark area. Can you see this? They were not seen in this section. So they were so tiny and they were missed. They were missed by 
क्लासिकल स्टेनिंग ऑफ हेमेटोक्सिलीन एंड नियोसिन एच एन ई ओके सो एच एन ई स्टेनिंग मिस्ट देम सो ओके एच एन ई स्टेनिंग सो इन ऑर्ड how to get rid of this lines there somebody know how to remove these lines pen color white no arrow no. okay so a special stain by cytokeratine can reveal tumor cells in a lymph node which were missed by hne staining this is the message immuno this is called immunohistochemistry immunohistochemistry please please it these are called isolated tumor cells isolated tumor cells so someone else is making these lines is it someone else is making these lines no it <laughs> i don't know acha um so these are isolated tumor cells shown by special stain cytokeratine now okay now we got right history bata rahi hai ki zoom is not a safe app option hacking hoti hai dikhe ko bahut bada um now please tell me what is cytokeratine can somebody tell dr rajuta any guess what is cytokeratine what is so special that cytokeratine stained these no, uh, cells and normal stain did not why yes please it is a pan epithelial marker mm hmm it is a pan epithelial marker okay so it is cytoskeleton cytoskeleton of the cell if you go to some new building site initially Uh, you will find that big pillars are being erected uh, by the manufact the builders and they have steel rods steel rods coming from the ground and going like pillars and then they put cement and bricks and all other uh, around it okay so similar to those steel rods inside a big building we have special sticks you can imagine like steel rods inside a cell so there is a skeleton within the cell which keeps the cell why will otherwise building will collapse you don't have those steel rods in a building the building will collapse okay so similarly inside a cell we have those rods of steel to keep the cell intact this is called cytoskeleton this cytoskeleton consists of protein called cytokeratin okay and there are special cytokeratin for cells special epithelial cells this these are present only in epithelial cells the mesothelial or mesodermal cells do not have cytokeratin okay they do not have cytoskeleton like blood cells rbcs it will not pass you know 7 micron rbc passes through a capillary which has a diameter of about 5 micron 4 or 5 so just you know if you go to vaishnav devi or some uh, you know temple in the hills you have to crawl through a gufa a cave right so similarly rbc rbc travels through that gufa or cave 7 mm 7 micron rbc can pass through 5 micron diameter capillary how by its flexibility so the mesodermal cells will not function well blood cells are mesodermal isn't kind so mesodermal cells do not have cytoskeleton only epithelial cells have it so cytokeratin 19 is specific to the breast epithelial cells there is another special protein of the breast cells called mammoglobin it's the milk protein mammoglobin have you heard of mammoglobin it's the milk protein okay mammoglobin or milk protein is again present in breast epithelial cells not in the lymph node not in other fibrous tissue so if you can demonstrate presence of cytokeratin 19 or mammoglobin in a lymph node lymph node is what mesodermal 
lymph node arises from mesoderm okay so a mesoderm well, origin structure like a lymph node has no business to contain any cytokeratin because it is derived only from mesoderm mesenchymal structure it should not have any cytokeratin so if cytokeratin is present it has come from some epithelial structures and in a lymph node in the axilla if you have cytokeratin it is reasonable to presume it has come from the breast so presence of these cytokeratin is an indicator that some epithelial cells from the breast have come to the node and what do we call this lymph node metastasis so this is the earliest form of lymph node metastasis this is called isolated tumor cells okay so um, my teacher professor robert mansell in cardiff started the first large trial of evaluating sentinel node biopsy in united kingdom and he randomized from all over the england and wales 1031 patients half received sentinel node biopsy alone other half received axillary treatment in the form of full axillary dissection or four node sampling or axillary sampling okay and then these women were put on long term follow up and they found that women who had only sentinel nodes only 5% developed lymphedema only 11% developed sensory changes in the armpit in the form of pain discomfort anesthesia and paresthesia around the axilla and on the inner surface of the arm inner surface of the arm receives cutaneous nerves from the medial cutaneous of the arm and forearm they pass from the axilla and the intercostal brachial nerve is also t2 second intercostal nerve and you remember in cardiology classes they were teaching that the t2 to t5 is the distribution of the angina pectoris remember that so angina pectoris you know they were teaching that pain goes from the chest precordium to the inner surface of the upper arm yes angina pectoris so if you cut t2 there will be no distribution of the angina pectoris okay so all these changes do not occur only in 11% if you do only sentinel node biopsy however if you perform full axillary treatment 13% patients will develop lymphedema of the upper limb and about 31% will develop one third you can say one third 31 is one third of the all patient will have sensory loss so this is important to appreciate that lymphedema and sensory loss in the upper shoulder and arm are more common more common in women who were treated by full axillary node dissection compared to sentinel node biopsy alone first uh, large trial published by professor robert mansell of cardiff in the english speaking literature so relative risk of the lymphedema was reduced to 1/3 0.3 by doing sentinel node biopsy and relative risk of sensory loss again reduced to 0.3 that is 1/3 by reduced by sentinel node biopsy you can remember that the risk of lymphedema and sensory loss is reduced to 1/3 if we carry out sentinel node biopsy compared to full axillary dissection very useful now what happens to women where we perform full dissection versus sentinel node biopsy alone uh, meta analysis from several studies is summarized in this in this jama paper published in 2013 where they found that lymphedema occurs in the tune of 10 to 20% of women who undergo axillary lymph node dissection 10 to 20% okay if you give radiotherapy after axillary dissection it can even go further to up to 50% or more in sentinel node biopsy only 5 to 7% in different series quality of life reduction 35% in axillary lymph node dissection only 23% with sentinel node biopsy and arm shoulder pain numbness and pain one third 31% if you do alnd and only 11% if you do sentinel node biopsy so arm pain and shoulder are reduced to one third 11 versus 31 lymphedema reduced to one third and quality of life 
does not deteriorate if you perform sentinel node biopsy or long term follow up studies okay now what happens to uh, if we perform sentinel node biopsy and it is negative do we worsen their survival no we do not worsen their survival local recurrence occurs in 0.3% how do you interpret 0.3% can somebody tell 0.3% local recurrence means what if you operate 1000 ladies if you operate 1000 ladies three will develop recurrence 0.3 means right 0.3% means 3 out of 1000 okay so 997 ladies will remain alive and well with no recurrence only 0.3 recurrence 3 out of 1000 in the memorial sloan this was data from milan famous milan institute of amberto veronese in milan italy memorial sloan catering cancer center in new york again women who had sentinel node biopsy and were followed they had 0.12% local recurrence 0.12 means out of 1000 ladies only 12 had recurrence very low and similar another study 0.26 so all point in the decimal you know 3 out of 1000 26 out of 1000 now there is another overview of meta analysis where they found even if node was positive even if sentinel node was positive and no axillary node dissection was carried out because patient did not choose it, it was patient choice you know you have to take consent for every operation so in the long term follow up if they had micrometastasis so you have done sentinel node positive it is positive but only micrometastasis very large number of patient 3400 0.3% recurrence similar to women who have negative sentinel nodes just appreciate this negative sentinel node local recurrence 0.3% positive sentinel node but only harboring micrometastasis same recurrence 3 out of 1000 okay it's 1930 so what is the impression presence of micrometastasis in the sentinel node does not increase the local recurrence is that clear hello yes hello yes, are you still connected Yes, still yes. listening yes yes, yes. okay so just to recap okay so this is micrometastasis micrometastasis means 0.2 to 0.2 okay so less than 2 mm less than 2 mm 0.2 to 2 mm micrometastasis do not increase the chance of lady developing recurrence okay and what is macrometastasis great macrometastasis more than 2 mm more than 2 mm is called macrometastasis okay so presence of micrometastasis same recurrence as in negative sentinel node if it is macrometastasis then chance of recurrence slightly increases so macrometastasis is important more than 2 mm is important so i told the options for negative microscopic sentinel nodes no need of rnd follow up if you have positive sentinel nodes then what are the options so if it is node sentinel node is negative you are safe to leave the lady leave the axilla her axilla untreated you give chemotherapy radiotherapy if it is a cr positive trastuzumab if you tr pr positive give tamoxifen or anestrozole hormone therapy that all you do but no further treatment to axilla is offered if sentinel nodes are negative okay what to do if sentinel node is positive well these are the three options either just observe give adjuvant therapy all other things that you do in breast cancer and just observe as they did in this trial called z0011 trial very famous trial in the exam some examiner will ask you or there may be a theory question describe the um, the practice changing uh, 
uh, guidelines from, derived from Z0011 Zillianos trial. Or you do full X-ray dissection. If the two nodes are positive, you do full X-ray dissection. And the third option is give radiotherapy to the axilla. Not uh, dissect, but give radiotherapy. Okay. So there is a one large study where they saw the long-term follow-up of women who had micrometastasis in the lymph node. Micrometastasis. Okay. No extra capsulized spread, only micrometastasis. Micro. Micro is what? 0 0.2 to? 2 mm. 2 mm. Very good. Less than 2 mm. Less than 2 mm. So they found that the conclusion was survival was same. 84% in one group, 88%. Same in the two groups. Whether you perform ALND, exilino dissection or no, no exilino dissection. Okay? No difference. Disease-free survival. The conclusion from this very important study was that no need of actually no dissection if you have micrometastasis in the sentinel node. Micrometastasis do not matter. They do not spread elsewhere. Okay. Now, another study, the famous Dr. Giuliano's, Armando Giuliano's trial, also called American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, A-C-O-S-O-G. That's the acronym used. And they had this number Z, Z or Z in America. You know, this letter uh, we call Z. In America, they call it Z. Z. Uh, Z0011 trial. Uh, it was set up by American College of Surgeons Oncology Group. So, ACOS OG is the acronym. So, women with T1 or T2 tumors, up to 5 centimeter tumors, where there was no palpable lymph nodes, clinically negative axilla, were then taken and the sentinel node biopsy was carried out. If they had two sentinel nodes positive, two macrometastases, two macrometastases, they were then given a consent form and they were randomized to either receive axillary node dissection or no further surgery to the axilla. And then they offered rest of the radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and then they followed. So this is called ACOS OG. Z0011 trial or Armando Giuliano's trial. Okay. Giuliano. This is Giuliano, the main investigator in this study. And so they either had sentinel node biopsy alone in 446 women or in 445 women, sentinel node biopsy was followed by full axillary lymph node dissection. And what was the final outcome? Initially, they reported 0.9%, that is 9 out of 1,000. 0.9, you should read it as 9 out of 1,000. Okay? Axillary recurrence. So, if you perform uh, sentinel load alone and you do in 1,000 patients, out of 1,000, only 9 women will develop recurrence in the armpit. So, 991 women will remain happy and healthy, recurrence disease free. Right? Out of 1,000, 991 women will remain happy and healthy with no axillary recurrence. In, if you do full ALND, 5 out of 1,000, 0.5, will have recurrence. So, what is the message? Even after full axillary node dissection, you do not cure the axilla. Still, 5 out of 1,000 will have disease coming back. Okay? Why? Why this happens? Can somebody tell? If we have done full axillary node dissection, we remove level 1, level 2, level 3 nodes. Why 5 out of 1000 are getting recurrence? Any idea? After full axillary node dissection. Why are you getting recurrence? Please? Are you listening? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. So, what is the, what is the reason for recurrence after full axillary node dissection? You have removed all the nodes. So where is disease coming back? From the arm. Well, small lymph nodes are embedded in fat. Small lymph nodes are embedded in fat and they may be missed during axillary node dissection. Okay? So tumor cells can grow and then cause increase. There was an earlier theory uh, proposed that there may be regeneration of the lymph nodes. But they have disproved that theory. There was a theory, you know, some egoistic 
you know, arrogant surgeon said, no, 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 I cannot miss any nodes. I have removed all the nodes. But still, uh, the pathologist said, but sir, uh, some patient up to 2 to 4 percent after axial intersection can have a recurrence. 2 to 4 percent is a reported figure after full node direction can have recurrence. So, surgeon said, no, 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 there must be rec uh, some regrowth, new, new nodes have formed. But uh, that theory has been disproved. Actually, small lymph nodes are embedded in the fat and they may be missed and they can grow. Okay, so 0.5 percent with full ALND, 0.9 percent after sentinel node. This is the axillary recurrence. Adverse outcome in the form of shoulder stiffness, pain, swelling of the arm were less if sentinel node 25 percent versus 70 percent if you have done full dissection. Survival 92 percent here, 91 percent here. Slightly less if you do, but no statistically significant difference. Okay. So these were the first results published in February 2010 in JAMA. So this is the schema here of the uh, Dr. Giuliano's study. 891 patient, half randomized to axillary node dissection, other half only sentinel node biopsy, and they were long term follow up. Okay. And look at this loco regional recurrence, free survival. In sentinel node group, 96% versus ALND group, 95%, slightly less. And these two curves, the dark black line, dark black line is the survival curve for axillary lymph node dissection patient. And dotted line is for women who had only sentinel node and no ALND. And look at this dotted line, the sentinel node alone are surviving better. Any guess why this is happening? Usually you will think that if you have done minimal sentinel node removal, uh, there should be more recurrence and more death. But why survival is better in sentinel node alone? Comorbidity. Lack of comorbidity. That is one thing. But see, Mother Nature created the lymph nodes for some purpose. Purpose was to produce immune cells. They have T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, plasma cells. They kill bacteria. They, they have macrophage-like activity, right? So some bacteria, toxins, some tumor cells go into the node. They are destroyed by the node. So if you have removed only two or three nodes and left the other 12 nodes inside, they are doing their purpose. So some tumor cells may be going, some bacteria may be growing, and they are killed by the remaining SLA nodes. In compared to this, where you have removed... All the, where you have removed the axillary nodes, those bacteria or cancer cells going into the axilla are not destroyed. So, naturally, yeah, okay, this picture. So, you have 15 to 20 nodes. In sentinel node biopsy, you removed only two nodes, okay? And all the nodes are there. So, if there are some more tumor cells going, some bacteria growing, bacteria go into the nodes and then they can cause bacteremia septicemia. So, those lymph nodes are destroying the bacteria and their toxin and cancer cells. If you remove all the nodes, any bacteria, any cancer cell going goes directly into circulation and causes problem. Okay. So survival was slightly less in women who had full axillary node dissection. So you can tell your teacher tomorrow in the morning round that, sir, please stop doing full axillary node dissection in women who do not have any palpable lymph nodes. Okay. Otherwise, most surgeons in, uh, in Asia, in India, and in you know, neighboring countries, Bangladesh, Nepal, they say, oh, no, 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 we will always do full axillary node dissection, uh, basically because they have not uh, thought about the consequences of full axillary node dissection. Okay? Now, disease-free survival. Sentinel node alone group. Center alone group is this dotted line. Dotted line patients, they have better disease-free survival compared to this black line. Black line is what? Women who have full axillary node dissection. Their survival curve, again, slightly less. 83% versus 82%. So by doing sentinel node alone, you're actually helping these ladies to survive better and remain disease-free. 
what a nice thing to do. So you should learn to do sentiment modifiers. Now, what about the late recurrences? When from that Dr. Jalyanu's trial, uh, we learned that uh, at even the initial data was presented as six years follow up. Now we have 9.25 years follow up. And uh, in our department, Dr. Tritiman Mitra had recently reviewed this his long term follow up paper in one of our journal clubs. Uh, maybe one day we can discuss uh, this paper at length, or we can do some journal clubs, you know. And Dr. Rijita, you can arrange some journal clubs later. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, local recurrence in ALND group 15, uh, sorry, 3.6% at 6 years and 5.8% in 9 years follow up. Okay. 5.8. In Sentinel Node group, 1.8% here and 3.8. Even at 9 years, their local recurrence, local, right, is less than that in the ALND group. What a nice thing to have, okay? What about the regional nodes? That is in the XLR. Initially, it was 0.5% ALND, and at nine years, it remains 0.5%. Here in the Sentinel node, it's 0.9. Initially, at six years, it has become slightly more. From four patients, one more patient has developed. So, it has percent has changed from 0 0.9 to 1.5, but only one more patient in nine years follow up. So even at 9.5 year, 2.5 year follow up, the results remain excellent and superior, superior to the those women who undergo full axillary node dissection. Okay. So local regional recurrence, even at 10 year cumulative local recurrence and local regional recurrence are less in the red red bar diagram red bar diagram is the data of ladies who underwent only sentinel load biopsy blue bar diagram is those who had full excellent dissection you can see the lower bar lower bar means less broker region recurrence with the sentinel load so 10 year overall survival published recently in 2017 by dr giuliano paper and sentinel load depicted by the blue line above and ALND full dissection by the orange line below. The survival curve of the women undergoing ALND remains lower, inferior compared to those who have sentinel node. So even at long-term 10-year follow-up, the results of women who have only sentinel node biopsy remains superior even at long-term 10-year follow-up. Okay. I think we have already done that. Yeah. Okay. Another option here is to, after mapping axilla, that is sentinel node biopsy, what more you can do? Well, you can often radiotherapy. You remember in B04 trial, we saw that giving radiotherapy to axilla reduced the local recurrence. You remember that? Yes, sir. Initially, you know, the first trial at B04 in 1970s in America. 16%. B04, one of the first trials in the breast cancer surgery. So where they had either Halstead radical mastectomy or yeah B04 trial, NSAP B04 trial, where women either had randomized for a radical mastectomy, had 40% chance of microscopic cancer cells, and in total mastectomy, only 19% develop recurrence. If you give radiotherapy, total mastectomy with radiotherapy, out of 19%, only 2.9 had recurrence. So, lot of these cells, lot of these cells were killed, five-sixths of these actually were killed by radiotherapy. So, microscopic cancer cells in a lymph node can be destroyed and killed by radiotherapy. So, this is the message we had learned long time ago in 1970s from B06, B04 trials and many other trials study later on. And based on that uh, wisdom, uh, they applied that uh, uh, knowledge for the benefit of ladies who had minimal disease in the axillary node. This is called the MROS trial. Axillary after mapping axilla, what more? After mapping. 
after mapping axilla that is sentinel node mapping radiotherapy or surgery and this is the acronym mros trial very famous european trial mros trial mros trial again uh, dr rudzer and professor robert mansell from uk were the uh, principal investigator for this eortc based eortc is the short form eortc is the who wing for dealing with cancer okay like these uh, these days you know uh, there is a branch of who which is dealing with the covid uh, epidemic pandemic so similarly they have a cancer wing and that cancer wing in europe is called european organization for research and treatment in cancer eortc so radiotherapy or surgery of the axilla positive up to two positive nodes mros trial so they took women again with up to 5 cm that is t1 and t2 tumors clinically node negative they were either having breast conservation or mastectomy no age bar and they had to have informed consent multicentric cancers or those who had received near urgent treatment or prior axillary treatment or other cancers elsewhere in the body in history had been excluded so this is the schema of the uh, trial uh, design t1 t2 clinically and zero tumor randomized to receive either axillary node dissection or axillary radiotherapy so they had sentinel node biopsy and then based to this randomization sentinel node biopsy breast radiotherapy or okay so in this group full aldd done and other half randomized to have radiotherapy done okay so out of 4800 patient initially taken 4806 random assigned 2400 to lymph node dissection 2400 to axillary radiotherapy so radiotherapy means only radiotherapy uh, to the axilla and to the breast okay focusing on focusing on axilla focusing on axilla because they have to destroy the microscopic tumor cells there and look at this results now they have published data for long term follow up even after 10 years of follow up the blue line depicts the recurrence rate of women who had received axillary node dissection and the red line depicts the recurrence rate axillary recurrence rate of women who had axillary radiotherapy red line radiotherapy blue line aldd okay hello yeah is there some comment hello no sir please continue okay so these the red and blue lines beautifully overlap exactly till the last day of follow up so how nicely demonstrated that the recurrence rate of the two different treatments are just overlapping there are no statistical difference even at the end of more than 10 years of follow up so look at the axillary recurrence rate aldd women 4 out of 744 that is 0.5 okay 0.5 and in radiotherapy treatment group 1.19 7 out of 680 7 out of 684 4 so very small difference right only 0.5 here and 1 here so you can summarize the results of all the radiotherapy trials and mros trial if you have micrometastasis if you have micrometastasis axillary recurrence 0.2% no additional therapy 1.9 1.9 point to almost you know not much difference if you have macrometastasis as in z11 z11 ziliano trial macro means more than 2 mm more than 2 mm macro more than 2 mm 0.5 in x ray recurrence and 0.9 in no radiotherapy and at 10 year it is 1.5 okay amaros trial radiotherapy 1.2% recurrence surgery 0.4% 1.2.4 to 0.4 no statistical difference at the 10 year of follow up okay so this is in nutshell the data for micrometastasis no further treatment needed macrometastasis up to two nodes you can do just observe and radiotherapy is effective as shown by this amaros trial there is another trial 
which is in um, process of being uh, um, carried out and final data analysis uh, is awaited this is called positive sentinel node observation versus clearance posnoc posnoc trial posnoc trial okay and uh, again they are taking up to three nodes women either having um, mastectomy or full um, or bct only so any patient wle or mastectomy with sentinel node biopsy they will either do axillary treatment alnd or radiotherapy or no axillary treatment okay and they will follow in the long run so it dr amit goel from uk um, is the principal investigator in this trial and we are awaiting the results so the asco guidelines suggest that if the sentinel nodes are negative no further treatment for axilla up to two positive sentinel nodes and you have done breast conservation no axillary node dissection because you have to give radiotherapy to the breast and that will take care of the microscopic nodes in the axilla positive nodes after mastectomy you should do axillary dissection that's the current guideline okay so in mastectomy group especially if the sentinel node is positive you should do full axillary dissection in t3 and t4 tumors advanced cancers and inflammatory breast cancer please avoid sentinel node biopsy because there is a high failure rate high false negative rate you should better do axillary lymph node dissection t3 t4 advanced cancers and inflammatory cancers and inflammatory cancers full dissection sentinel node biopsy is risky okay although in europe and america they are doing post chemo sentinel node biopsy after primary chemotherapy in n1 or n2 patient n2 means matted nodes even in those they are doing chemotherapy first and then doing sentinel node biopsy but message is we have a high failure rate up to 20% false negative if you remove more than three nodes then it is reduced to less than 10% but you have to use dual tracers isotope plus the blue dye okay not single tracer otherwise failure rate is high so throughout the world now they are observing that women who are coming with more and positive nodes is going down and red dot is those who are having sentinel node only sentinel node only uh, the proportion of women each year in europe at least is going up and up because ladies are coming to the doctor with very early stage disease where they have either no nodes positive or have only up to two sentinel nodes where they are not doing any x-ray dissection so that's a beautiful trend and we hope uh, that in asia also we will achieve similar trend and keep the most patients free from axillary treatment this is indeed uh, happening in uh, europe so um, no no axillary surgery no axillary surgery why because now we are not deciding whether to give chemotherapy or not based on axillary nodes tissue we are giving on based on her if her rich tumor it's aggressive disease you have to give chemotherapy so you don't count nodes positive or negative you have to give chemotherapy in all patient who are her rich triple negative you have to give chemotherapy so you forget the nodes you base your decision to give chemotherapy or not on biomarker it's triple negative give chemo her rich give chemo hello 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 i think there is loss of connection from sir side okay
press shift command and alter shift command hello hello, hello. yes yeah your That's... connection was lost sir okay now yeah now we can hear you but we cannot see the computer okay now hmm yeah the slide is visible or not slide is not visible computer screen is visible okay okay now slides are visible slides are visible Mm hmm. De-escalation. Can you see this now? Green slide. Yes, sir. De-escalation. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So now there are two trials um, on the way, where they are evaluating this concept that uh, why enter the axilla, why does do even sentinel node biopsy if we have to just give radiotherapy and chemotherapy and trastuzumab and other targeted therapies and not give radiotherapy or accelerated node dissection in early disease. So there is one trial called SOUND trial, which is being carried out in Italy, in Milan, and uh, uh, on 1,500 patients. And there's a German trial, German-Austrian trial, with 5,900 patients in SEMA trial. In both trials, they are evaluating no axillary surgery versus sentinel node biopsy. So they take, select these patients, early breast disease, only T, T1, T1 tumors, less than 2 centimeter. Then they do axillary ultrasound. And if there are no suspicious nodes, then they are randomizing into either no axillary surgery or sentinel node. So very interesting. It's 20 hours. And it will, long term follow up will reveal the safety of this uh, trial. So what are the pitfalls of the axillary assessment? One is that in locally advanced breast cancer, sentinel node biopsy has not been shown to be safe. It has a high false negative and many patients will have recurrence in the axilla if you only do sentinel node biopsy. Inflammatory breast cancer, again, very rapidly aggressive disease, high false negative rate if you do only sentinel. So this is one problem. Now, after chemotherapy in LABC, locally advanced breast cancer, uh, the, uh, suppose the node contain cancer. So it undergoes necrosis and necrosis tissue is replaced by fibrous tissue. This fibrosis in the node and in the lymphatics will not allow the dye to enter. Okay, so the whole node is destroyed, but the lymphatic is blocked by fibrosis. So what will happen? You inject the blue dye, it will go to some other channel. It will go to some other node. You will take out that other node, which doesn't have cancer cells. You will feel happy that, look, I have removed two nodes and they all have free from cancer. And so, you know, uh, you don't do X-ray dissection. Two years later, lady comes back. She has dissect palpable nodes in the axilla. You do full dissection. So that is called axillary recurrence after sentinel node, negative sentinel node. So it is an example of false negative. Sentinel node was false negative, but cancer cells were there. In the follow-up, one year later, they grew. So it is false negative axillary sampling or axillary dissection is common up to 20% cases in new adjuvant chemotherapy group. Okay. So then sentinel node biopsy is a special technique like laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a special technique and you have to learn every step of laparoscopic cholecystectomy to reduce the bile duct injury, portal vein injury and other complications. Similarly, you have to learn the correct technique of sentinel node biopsy. Otherwise, you will carry it out and give a wrong name. Some people will do sentinel node biopsy without proper training and even first year JR or, or anybody you know, will do it with no training and they will report then 18%, 20% false negative rate. Well, that is wrong because they had not done the training. If you don't know how to ride a bicycle or a scooter and you just go on a scooter or bicycle, what will happen? You will fall. You will blame the scooter that it's not good or a bicycle. 
but actually you did not receive proper training. So that is wrong. You must receive training uh, by a trained surgeon. And we offer training in All India Institute in Lucknow, Sanjay Gandhi. They offer training in Valor and Tata. They all centers of excellence where training is offered for sentinel node biopsy. So please do visit us and learn this technique. We don't charge any money. It's totally free. You can stay here for one week, 10 days as observer, one month. We have a lot of doctors coming from um, mostly from Bangladesh and Nepal and come as observer and they learn the technique and they do it in their way, in their center. So what is the way ahead? Train surgeons in axillary ultrasound and sentinel node biopsy and try some other techniques like isotope so, or fluorescent dye like fluorescein. So we did some work on fluorescein at this center. This is called uh, ACTRE, Advanced Center for Cancer Treatment and Education for Cancer. It's a research wing of Tata Memorial Center located in Navi, Mumbai. So um, we did this study of fluorescent dye and did some special studies in uh, breast cancer. So we found that fluorescein can be injected into the breast and when seen with blue light, it shines green. It emits green fluorescence. So we take very little amount of fluorescein, 0.1 ml, in 4 ml of normal saline, and we'll take methylene blue also 1 ml and inject into the breast half intradermal and half deep to areola. Okay. If there is a tumor deep to areola, we'll not inject there because the needle may puncture the tumor and cause tumor cell spread. Then we'll inject all around. So if there is a, a tumor here, then you should inject here or here. If you inject in the pathway of this tumor, then um, the lymphatics might have been blocked. So if we usually inject half here, periareolar, around the areola, towards the axilla, and half deep to areola, okay? So out of this 4 ml plus 1, 5 ml, 2.5 ml deep to areola, 2.5 ml around periareolar. If there's a tumor in here, then you inject away from the tumor, right? And then massage for five minutes. And you can see some dermal lymphatic plexus. The skin is very rich source of lymphatics. It's a very rich lymphatic plexus located just deep to the dermis. And in lean and thin persons, you can actually see some lymphatics from the injection site when you shine blue light. Blue light has a wavelength of 480 nanometer. So we carried out this study and after five minutes of massage uh, on this area, then we place a lateral crease in season. Uh, see, in almost all uh, ladies, you will find when they are lying supine with the hand, uh, you know, like this, 90% on the OT table, you will be able to see this distinct crease. Can you see this crease? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is a crease between breast mound here and axilla. Between the axilla and the breast mound, there's a distinct crease. It's called lateral memory crease. So the breast lymphatics, breast lymphatics travel like this. So this is nipple areola. This is nipple areola, this is axilla here. So they will travel like this and reach the pectoralis major. Then they take a 90 degree dip and they go to the first pectoral nodes. So if you place a lateral crease in here, you will find these lymphatics in more than 90% cases. Okay. So lateral crease in season, lateral crease in season is made here about two centimeter or so. And then we deepen the incision. We darken the room. We switch off all the OT lights and use this blue light, blue light. And you can see these shiny lymph nodes and then you can remove. So you can see this one node here. Connected to another node, connected to another node, connected to another. So we, in one patient, we found four nodes connected to each other. <coughs> so they will all be called sentinel nodes. Why? Because they are either blue, either blue, or they are receiving a blue-colored lymphatic. See, can you see this lymphatic here? Hello? Yes, can you sir. see this blue-colored lymphatic? This is a specimen which has been removed and put on the skin. So either a node which is blue, or a node in which a blue lymphatic is seen to enter will also be defined as sentinel node. So 
we got four nodes by this technique. So we perform this uh, evaluation uh, in a proper manner in Tata Memorial Center and then uh, later repeated this uh, in uh, All India Institute. And we had 96% identification when you combine with the uh, fluorescein, 92% identification, technetium, 96% identification, and false negative rate when you combine all the tracers, fluorescein plus blue dye. 8.3% with combined uh, tracers. And then we did a randomized trial comparing the two, where we had compared in one group, fluorescein and methylene blue, other group, technetium and methylene blue. And uh, we found that identification was 84% in fluorescein plus methylene blue, radioactive isotope plus methylene blue, again 84%, both similar. Okay, so these are the some. So, in conclusion, we can say that in patients who have clinically node palpable, you should arrange ultrasound guided biopsy of the lymph node. If they are positive, do full axillary lymph node dissection, ALND, okay? No palpable nodes, take her to ultrasound and no suspicious node, do a sentinel node biopsy. By usually dual tracer, blue dye plus isotope or blue dye plus fluorescein. You have two sentinel lymph nodes, positive. You can do either axillary radiotherapy if three or more nodes are positive and they are macro metastasis, macro, M A C R O, more than two mm. Okay, then you have to do axillary dissection. So, up to two macro metastases, you can depend on axillary radiotherapy as revealed in the MROS trial. And three or more positive nodes, we do not have any data. MROS trial did not include three or four positive nodes. Therefore, Today, with the best knowledge, we have to perform full axillary node dissection, okay? And for locally advanced breast cancers, post-chemotherapy, and in inflammatory cancer, we should do full axillary node dissection. So, right? So, we have to train our surgeons and train our pathologists in performing sentinel node biopsy. And uh, through this training and teaching, we have to generate uh, level 1 randomized uh, level 1 evidence that sentinel node biopsy is safe even in the Asian centers of India, Nepal, Bangladesh and other countries. So yeah, this fluorescent guided technique has been appreciated by physicists uh, across the world and uh, the, this gentleman sitting here, he is the editor-in-chief of the nature photonics. Nature has many branches now, like, like nature infection, nature cancer, nature cardiology, and so on. So nature photonics deals with all the optics uh, um, related research, laser related research. And this gentleman, a physicist from London, Oliver Graydon, he is the editor in chief. And he appreciated this work so much that he published an editorial in the March 2019 issue um, and he said that it is an innovation in India. It's one of the innovations. So with this, I stop here and take questions. And if you please ask questions, if you have any. Yes, please. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, please. Huh? Sir, uh, in combined tracer, uh, the amount of fluorescein used is 0.1 ml or 1 ml? Now we are using 0 0.1 ml. 0 0.1. 0 0.1 ml dissolve in 4 ml saline. Yes, sir. 0, 0 point is very small amount. So you should take it and measure it in a tuberculin syringe. Okay, sir. Tuberculin. If you try in ordinary syringe, you know, you will make a mistake. But tuberculin syringe has 1 ml divided into 10, you know, a small. 0.1.2. So 0 0.1 ml dissolved in 4 ml saline will give a very dilute fluorescein. Fluorescent dyes have this property of more fluorescence with more dilution. It's like homeopathy principle. You know, they say that more dilution of mother tincture makes it more potent. You know, in homeopathy, they take that, they tell that. Similarly, here in fluorescence, what has happening is based on the principle of physics that if you have uh, molecules very close by, right? The light comes 
it is it stimulates the electrons which are they jump into higher energy orbital level and which is unstable then the electrons come back when they come back to their normal state they emit photons they emit this energy in the form of photons so if you give blue light to the fluorescein the light which will come out as photon will be in the green range green range okay so you will see okay. green fluorescence now if there are very few molecules say one molecule here and one there you will see the fluorescence coming into your eyes you will record it and the fluorescence coming if you have very molecules tightly close to each other what will happen this molecule emits photon okay so instead this molecule emits photon is taken up by another molecule nearby so in high concentration the molecules very close by they stimulate each other and the fluorescence remains within that solution it doesn't come to your retina so you don't record it okay so in high concentration you get less fluorescence if you dilute it you will see more fluorescence try one day take this fluorescein and just uh, drop uh, 0.1 ml and put it in water in a test tube or a glass or a beaker you know you will see a small very blue fluorescent greenish uh, cloud forming inside the beaker or glass so more dilution of fluorescein better is the fluorescence so 0.1 ml in 4 ml saline i'll Thank send you. the uh, you have my email i'll send the full methodology and if you want to do a study you can come and spend a week or 10 days with us uh, in aims and we will teach you the methodology will uh, you know um, and then give you the uh, whole the literature okay yes okay Now, thank uh, you okay so this is all about fluorescein now we'll just uh, go to some other tracers which are currently being used another tracer is called endocyanin endocyanin green endocyanin green uh, has been used Uh, by heart specialist in measuring the cardiac output or ss right and in uh, uh, plastic surgery they use it for assessing the vascularity of an organ so they are doing say microvascular flap surgery they inject iv uh, i uh, endocyanin icg and then using this uh, infrared camera it's called spy camera infrared camera it emits uh, the uh, infrared light in the range of 780 nanometer 780 nanometer is the infrared light which stimulates this green icg endocyanin green okay and then you capture the uh, picture and you can see the blood vessel so this is whole setup you cover it with a plastic sterile cover uh, and then you focus on the area you inject uh, fluorescein and you can uh, like we are injecting methylene blue or fluorescein in the dermis or areola similarly you inject icg endocyanin in the skin and then you can see the lymphatics okay and you can even see a node you can see a node here which looks green on this endocyanin green and you can mark that on the skin that this is where the hot node is being seen and you will place a small cut there and remove the node so advantage is that you can see where the node is and place a small tiny cut exactly on the node and uh, get this hot node so endocyanin green it needs infrared light source to stimulate it in the range of 780 nanometer excitation and then the emission is again infrared it will be around 820 nanometer so white light is what we see by our naked eye our retina can see light from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer below 400 it is called ultraviolet you remember vibgeor violet indigo blue green uh, and yellow and red vibgeor in physics so on other side one side we have violet less than 400 is called ultraviolet more than 700 is called infrared red is red red is 700 okay so 400 to 700 is the range of light what we call white light or sunlight is also similar and this is the light that we can see with our naked eye okay we cannot see ultraviolet light less than 400 we cannot see infrared light which is beyond 700 okay so you need a special 
camera, a special infrared camera to capture these pictures. And these are the trade names of the, these capturing device available in the market. One is called photodynamic eye, other is called hyper eye um, in Japan, and they make it, or a spy camera from US. Uh, so all these cameras are especially designed, uh, but they are very expensive. This photo PDE, photodynamic eye, uh, costs 35 lakhs. This is spy camera, we have that spy camera. It costs uh, this camera. You know the cost of this machine? One crore 75 lakhs. One crore 75 lakhs, right? Very expensive. So you need very, very special and very expensive capturing device. This is the problem with endocyanin dream. Okay. So a lot of data has been generated or endocyanin dream and um, there are some problems here. If the patient is sensitive to iodine, uh, there's allergic to iodine, you should not use it because it has a iodide salt in it. Okay, although otherwise it's very safe, but the cost is a factor. Um, now, uh, there's a gentleman called Dr. Benson, John Benson in Cambridge. He has done a lot of research in fluoros uh, endocyanin green based sentinel node biopsy and reported best one of the best detection rates. ICG alone 100%. Okay, so and false negative 0%. Excellent results have been reported by Dr. Benson in Cambridge using ICG. And 15 studies have been you, um, carried out and a meta-analysis on these studies has been carried out, which shows that, again, excellent identification and 100% identification. False negative in four studies, zero. So what more do you need? 100% identification and zero false negative. Ideal, you know, win-win uh, situation. So, but the cost is a factor. So we, that's why we have worked on fluorescein. The blue light um, costs only 100 rupees. Um, most of these blue LEDs in the market um, have been made in China. So we do not know uh, if some Indian company will make it following this uh, pandemic of coronavirus. But uh, it's, it's easily available and it's very affordable, okay, endocyanin. So if you compare endocyanin green performance versus radiocolloid isotope, <clears throat> Share. Yeah? Yeah, we can see the we can see the screen now. Okay, you can see the screen. Okay, so I showed you the results of ICG. So you can see this forest plot. Hello? Yes, it's seen. So forest plot in a meta analysis indicates uh, that the pooled results are shown by a diamond here. 
can you see a diamond here yes okay there's a diamond in the picture and if you see the diamond that means half going on one side a half going on the other side that means the results are exactly similar okay so the results of the radio colloid that is fluorescein with isotope are similar to that obtained by icg okay okay now uh, okay now when you compare icg performance with the blue dye can you see the screen now yes sir yes okay so here uh, blue dye it's in a small frame but i can use cursor here so then so if you have a, the forest plot the this diamond is going on one side of the of the null value one that means it is favoring the indocyanin green so the results of blue dye are poor compared to results of indocyanin green okay so cost of the dye and cost cost of dye is about 800 rupees per ampule of this um, oro green or icg and the machine is i told you 35 lakhs is the cheapest other method of identifying the um, technique uh, the sentinel node is a contrast enhanced ultrasound now usually um, you can see the blood as flowing structure but if you inject some contrast with like air bubbles or micro bubbles you can see the moving micro bubbles in the lymphatics okay so a special contrast have been generated where some gas has been filled and a micro bubble has been formed can you see this on the left side on the yes, left sir. side okay there's a orange thing micro bubble and inside that they have put this gas sf gas okay and so these micro bubbles are injected just like we inject blue dye into the dermis near nipple areola and then you massage towards axilla and you put a ultrasound probe on the breast and then you trace these lymphatics and you can see as in this ultrasound picture you can see that these lymphatics are seen and then you biopsy those nodes uh, which are revealed by the contrast and then you look at the results so this is called contrast enhanced ultrasound scan and contrast enhanced ultrasound based sentinel node biopsy this is a new technique but the studies are very promising okay ultrasound but false negative may be higher then um, if you compare the standard technique with the contrast enhanced so again this is a forest plot and you see the one value null value and the diamond here is favoring the standard can you see that diamond is favoring a standard that means contrast enhanced ultrasound does not perform as well as the standard that is standard b blue dye plus fluorescein blue dye plus fluorescein okay so then other new technique is called super paramagnetic iron oxide so you know iron
Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. It was disconnected. Now we are connected again. Okay. Thank you. Just finishing last two slides. Okay. So this super. We cannot see the computer. Not see the computer. So again, go back to Zoom, maybe. Hmm? Share screen. Share screen. And share. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this is called super paramagnetic iron oxide. Okay. So this this is based on the um, magnetic property. You inject some iron particles, iron oxide particles, and then trace them by this magnetic probe. Okay. And the study is quite interesting because you are not using any isotope, and uh, so anybody can use it. The problem with isotope is you know you have to have availability of the isotope in your hospital. Then in the morning you have to tag or mix technetium-99 isotope with some particle like sulfur colloid or like antimony. It has to be freshly prepared. So if you receive from Bombay, Atomic Energy Commission, Trombay, the technetium, and then in your lab, you have to mix with sulfur colloid. Then only you can use it. If you do not have facility for these nuclear medicine uh, lab, then you cannot do it. And then other problem is that if you, the doctor, or your patient are pregnant, then you can not use isotope. With magnet, with fluorescein, with ICG, you can still use them. They are safe in pregnancy and uh, there's no radiation hazard. So super magnetic, uh, uh, interesting study, and but it is evolving technique. And again, machine is very expensive. Okay. So then other method is computed tomography. Computed tomography. Like CT, special CT scan. So uh, you perform a special CT scan and then there's a dye called iopamidol. Iopamidol and <clears throat> and then you inject iopamidol, which is a dye for uh, for CT scan, contrast of the CT, okay? It will go to the lymphatics and then you will do a contrast CT and show whether you can identify these central nodes and take a biopsy. Actually sampling, if you don't have any of these facilities, you can do actually sampling. It has been found to be very effective. So in actually sampling, what we are doing that we are taking the lymph nodes, we are taking the lymph nodes from lower part of axilla. You can, can you see this muscle? This is pectoralis major muscle. And on this side is the latissimus dorsi muscle. And this nerve here is called, what? Intercostobrachial nerve. Intercostobrachial nerve. It is the T2, lateral cutaneous branch of the T2. Okay. So you stay below this nerve. So tissue, a block of triangular or pyramidal tissue between pectoralis major latissimus dorsi, below the intercostobrachial nerve, this block of tissue is removed, sent for histology. This is called axillary sampling based on anatomical landmarks. And obviously, you are removing the level one nodes. You are removing the level one nodes below the nerve, below the intercostobrachial nerve. So it's a low level one dissection, actually. It's a low level one dissection. And in Tata Memorial Hospital, they have mastered this technique of axillary sampling, anatomical uh, landmark based axillary sampling. Okay. So this is, I think, so I'll just conclude here that uh, saying that uh, you should perform axillary dissection if the nodes are palpable in invasive breast cancer or if you are doing mastectomy for in situ breast cancer.
Yes, sir. Okay. So there is a last slide. So what I am saying is that we can evaluate the Excela by following a very systematic approach. Evaluate the palpable nodes by ultrasound guided biopsy. If the sentinel, if the biopsy shows positive nodes, carry out full axillary node dissection. No palpable nodes. Sonography shows a suspicious node. Biopsy of that node. If positive, axillary node dissection. If negative, take this lady for sentinel lymph node biopsy, and you can use fluorescein with methylene blue with equally good results and you do not need radioisotope, okay? If you don't have any of these, you just perform axillary nodal sample between rectalis major and latissimus dorsi, stay below the intercostal nerve, and uh, you'll also get good method of evaluating the axilla and avoid the morbidity, short and long-term morbidity of full axillary dissection in the form of shoulder pain and stiffness, more seroma, more... Uh, anesthesia and paresthesia in the arm and in the long run, more, long run, more lymphedema. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Hello. Thank you, Hello. sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes, Hello. Please. Yes, please. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, Namaskar. Sir, please tell us something. Sir, please tell us about axillary reverse mapping. Axillary reverse mapping. Okay. Uh, in 2005, um, we had done this study and we found that uh, uh, it's not very helpful. Actually, reverse mapping is a very interesting concept. So you inject some dye, you, in hmm. you inject some dye either in the web space in the hand, right? Yes. Okay, or in the inner side of the upper arm. And then you massage it for, uh, okay? Yes. And then it will go to the axilla. Then during, when you place an incision in the axilla, you dissect these blue lymphatics or if you are using endocyanin green, you use a, that infrared camera and you show these lymphatics. They are the lymphatics coming from the upper arm. Okay? So they are the lymphatics coming from the upper arm and you can see them by blue color or by ICG and then preserve those lymphatics which are above the which are coming from the upper arm and lying mm -hmm. above the axillary vein. But if the lymphatics are going into the node, axillary nodes, they are below the axillary vein, you will have to remove them. Okay. So yes. we tried to do uh, axillary reverse mapping, thinking that we will be able to preserve the lymphatics from the upper limb and thus reduce the chance of lymphedema. But that has not happened. Reason? Most axillary lymphatics actually enter the axillary nodes. They are below the axillary vein. And by definition of the axillary node dissection, if the nodes are positive, you have to remove all the nodes located below the level of axillary vein. So this was the reason we have stopped doing axillary reverse mapping. Most centers have actually stopped because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very rare to have a lymphatics going above the axillary vein and not entering the axillary nodes. Uh, Any good other? Evening, good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening. Uh, sir, what is the role for uh, doing axillary mapping using lymphocentigraphy pre op Lymphocentigraphy. So, lymphocentigraphy is like tracing the lymphatics, injecting the gamma uh, isotope radioactive, you know, colloid, technetium sulfur colloid with sulfur colloid or antimony. And then usually it is done a day before the operation. And then lady then goes to a, a gamma camera. So she lies on, under a gamma camera and like a CT scan, you know. So you will see all those lymphatics, the hot lymphatics. And if you see the two or three nodes which have accumulated or concentrated the dye, concentrated the isotope, you see two hot nodes or three hot nodes in the axilla. So you know 
that the, your dye has gone to a lymph node, which is looking hot on the gamma camera. So next day, when you take this lady to the operation theater, Hello. Yeah, he's trying again. Hello, sir, we can see you. Okay, okay. So, lymphocentigraphy is good if you are learning sentinel node mapping based on radioisotope sulfur colloid, technetium sulfur colloid. So you can see it's like a doing arteriography, right? In arteriography, you inject the dye in the vessels and then you see a road map of the arteries. Similarly, you can see road map of the lymphatics and the lymph nodes which are hot. So if you have seen one day before two hot nodes on lymphocentigraph, you are expecting at least two hot nodes in the operation theater also. If you have not seen any hot nodes in the lymphocytography, then sometimes you also miss any hot node in operation theater. Okay, so the, the lymphocytography helps in identifying the location and number of hot nodes present or not. If they are absent, then chances are that you will also miss them in the um, operation theater. But it's not mandatory. You can after initial training, you can easily perform uh, sentinel node mapping without a lymphocentigraphy. Sir, and one more question. Yes, please. Uh, sir, for the uh, trial Z1071 trial, where it was yes. done after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh -huh. the results are not considered uh, good enough for that technique to be adopted in regular practice. Yes, very right. We have, we have stopped doing sentinel node for locally advanced breast cancer, T3, T4 tumor. We, uh, we arrange preoperative chemotherapy and then this is and we perform full dissection, but by that time, disease had spread. Yes, please. Yes, yes, please. Hello? Sir, yeah. it, sir it was disconnected. Now it's connected again. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, um, you know, the uh, in locally advanced setup, what happens? You give pre-op chemotherapy there is the node is positive it undergoes necrosis tumor cells hello yes sir yeah so if the node contains tumor it will undergo necrosis by pre-op chemotherapy right whole node will necrose and it will replace by fibrosis Similarly, the lymphatics may also undergo fibrosis. Due to fibrotic blockade in the lymphatics, the dye, blue dye or isotope will not enter this node. It will go to some other pathway. It will show some other blue node. You will remove that other node, which doesn't have cancer. And the pathologist says, no metastasis seen. You feel happy. Okay. And one year later, she comes back with recurrence in the axilla. So that is very sad. And therefore, we have stopped doing at least in all India Institute, we do not do um, sentinel node biopsy after chemotherapy in locally advanced breast uh, cancers, uh, T3, T4 tumors. We just do 
level one at least, even if there is no palpable node. If there are palpable nodes, we'll do full axillary dissection. In locally advanced cancer, we have to be careful. They have advanced disease, not only in the breast, but may also have an axilla. And sentinel node in this program, as you have see, said, in that trial, sentinel trial has high failure rate. We have also witnessed high failure rate, so we have stopped doing it. Hello, any other question? Hello. That's Hello. it, sir. Hello. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very much. So, uh, sentinel node technique is very simple to learn. Uh, you should uh, all visit a center nearby, you know, your uh, medical college and learn this technique. If you can come to New Delhi or India Institute of Medical Sciences, you are most welcome. We offer free training. You can stay for one week, one month, two months and learn the technique. We'll give you a free, we'll gift you with a free blue light and give you all the literature and teach you how to perform the sentinel node target. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll have the next meeting maybe two days later. Today is 16. So 18? Yes, sir. Not. Okay. So, um, so what topic do you want to discuss? Maybe advanced breast cancer or? Yes, sir. Advanced. Okay. Advanced. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, see you on 18th evening. Thank you very much.